Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Monica Kress. I'm an associate professor of sociology here at the LSE, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this lecture on behalf of LSE Human Rights. This lecture, entitled The Human in Human Rights, is the second in a three-part series delivered by Professor Craig Calhoun. The first part is available as a podcast, so if you've missed that one, you can still listen in. And we hope to make this lecture available in the same way. Craig Calhoun is University Professor of the Social Sciences at Arizona State University and a Centennial Professor at the LSE. Craig is a scholar of democracy and of solidarity, and he is published widely on social movements, nationalism, humanitarianism, cosmopolitanism, and democracy, often reshaping the way scholars are thinking about uh, these issues. We are very happy to welcome Craig back to the LSE, where he's also a former director. Craig will speak to us for about 35 minutes, and after that, there will be time for questions until we reach the full hour. So please submit your questions via the chat, and I will do my best to convey your questions to Craig. Craig, over to your thoughts. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Monica. Thanks to everybody who helped to organize this and make it possible. And thank you to everyone who's attending. As we all learn about Zoom, but also become tired, uh, we are experimenting with format. So our hope here is that a shorter lecture without slides will be more personal, which seems appropriate to the subject, and will allow us quickly to get into questions and discussions. Thinking about and trying to act on the basis of human rights confronts a range of theoretical questions. These include, are rights humanly created, divinely instituted, or if neither, where do they come from? This has been argued, especially in terms of distinctions between natural law and political accounts of rights. Natural law approaches are especially oriented to a moral foundation prior to or outside of politics. This has been most coherently presented as a religious position, but it is not uniquely religious. And it's a widespread orientation within human rights thinking. That is, we seek um, in the human rights framework a pre-political understanding of what it is that unites human beings and what human beings are, as it were, owed. I will acknowledge by way of foreshadowing that I am skeptical of our ability to reach a full pre-political understanding, though not of the idea that there's nothing outside politics. This position from natural law is also interestingly supplemented by the idea of self-evidence of rights which figures in the US Declaration of Independence. We hold these rights to be self-evident. It also figures in French revolutionary era thought at about the same time as Lynn Hunt has explored. And in a certain way, um, it continues to live in a widespread notion that we understand what's right when we see it. Political approaches, by contrast, raise the question of how much any regime of rights applies only to members of the polity. The distinction of, of human rights from civil rights signals this, but also a great deal of debate that has been carried on recently about the political approach, the political understanding of rights. Since World War II, and especially since the 1970s, discussion and application of human rights has focused especially on the cosmopolitan order across, among, or beyond nation states. There is a politics to international relations, of course, and that's part of the issue for human rights. 
But it's also significant that this is in part a distancing from domestic politics. And as Sam Moyne has argued, this is in sharp tension with the projects of securing better societies through citizenship, as we see manifested by the fact that inequality has grown dramatically at the same time since the 1970s that human rights approaches have most flourished. What is going on in this neoliberal era is a complex question I mostly need to postpone, but what is not going on however, is significant. And this is the kind of projects of social transformation previously undertaken as socialism, democracy, radical republicanism, and post-colonial nationalism. To a considerable extent, human rights has come to be a substitute for these projects of transformation, a way of talking about how to be good without altering the basic structures of political economy and society. Both natural law and practical cosmopolitan approaches are heavily dependent on some understanding of common humanity. In my first lecture in this series, I called into question the stability of such a category of common humanity. I compared the categorical perspective to relational understanding which I indicated showed promise. That is, instead of trying to identify some traits which all human beings share and which are not shared with non-humans, we might think about how we are connected to each other and how we relate to each other. In fact, the research of John Evans, a sociologist, has shown that at an informal, if you will, folk level, this is what many people do. They say they know human, who humans are by relating to humans. A relational approach is also prominent in many non-Western traditions. Confucianism is a preeminent example, though arguably not of the human, but of the self as a member of a well-ordered hierarchical society. It's not clear the Confucian tradition and a number of others extend recognition of the relational understanding from the self member to non-members and work with the category of the human similar to that of human rights. Perhaps a better evocation is Ubuntu, the Bantu term commonly employed to suggest being a part of humanity through sharing, or in one translation, humanity towards others. The Zulu, and also Kosa phrase, umuntu, ngumuntu, ngabantu means a person is a person through other people. But it does not foreground the individual rights and freedoms emphasized by the liberal tradition and basic to most human rights arguments. A great catch to many structures of relational identity is also the extent to which they depend on hierarchy. This is clearly the case in many non-Western societies. The human rights framework and much of the liberal tradition give us an illusion, I think, but at least a sense of escaping from certain issues of hierarchy. They underwrite ideas of political liberty and of equality of opportunity distinct from material outcomes and conditions. We have introduced a meritocratic notion of equal opportunity, not actual equality. And in order to shorten this talk, I've had to cut out a discussion of meritocracy and Michael Young's wonderful book, Introducing It and his dismay at later use of it as though it were unambiguously a positive thing. Meritocracy developed as a challenge to aristocratic models of inherited inequality, but it works very imperfectly, not least because it rationalizes greater inequality, even while disguising it as a matter of objective performance. Gene editing, could in fact bring a certain honesty to meritocracy. 
parents who wanted to reproduce family privilege would not have to hide their efforts behind biased systems of testing and university admissions. They could simply buy their children genetic superiority. Categorical thinking has been basic to how human rights have advanced equality. However, we shall miss it if we lose it. So I note the fragility of our categorical understanding with some trepidation. Relational thinking is crucial to solidarity, yet it is not perfect either. We should, I think, want complementarity, as for example, in politics, we might want all of liberty, equality, and solidarity in balance with each other. To foreshadow where I will end up, I will suggest that absolutist approaches to rights get in the way of this. We need to think more and better about how multiple rights are mediated with each other. But now I want to turn to one of the specific developments in our era that has most undermined and has the potential to further undermine the self-evidence of humanity. I mean, genetic engineering. May I ask you to start with an image of Lulu and Nana, though I can't show you their picture. Lulu and Nana, you may remember, are the pseudonyms for the genetically modified twins born in Shenzhen, China, in November 2018. There was a global flurry of media attention and eventually an outcry, punitive action, and promises of effective regulation. I'm not going to dwell in great detail on the specific case, but it is a useful starting place for thinking about the issue of remaking and potentially transforming the human and what that might mean for human rights. So let me briefly reprise the event. An ambitious young Chinese doctor, He Jiankui, used sophisticated gene editing techniques to disable a gene thought to facilitate infection with HIV. Lulu and Anna's father was HIV positive. The manifest intention was to create resistance for the children of an HIV infected man Though in fact, they faced minimal medical risk. There was little clinical reason for the procedure. Stigma may have been a bigger issue. In any case, He, the scientist, had studied and worked in the US and made the acquaintance of leaders in genetic engineering. His experiment was contrary to standard procedures, regulations, and possibly laws. It was conducted in secret, and much has been made of this, though that was partly for proprietary reasons and is also true of many experiments elsewhere. It was based on informed consent with formal applications for clinical trials. Who was proud of what he did? He planned a public announcement of his accomplishment at a major international scientific event expecting praise. The announcement was rushed when MIT Technology Review posted a few days before his planned speech about his experiment and in a way that suggested it might not be well received. Hood knew that he was taking risks, but had heard many leaders in the field talk about the importance of taking risks and pushing boundaries in order to make scientific breakthroughs. Indeed, when Hood's work was initially announced, China's People's Daily newspaper effusively described it as, quote, a historical breakthrough in the application of gene editing technology for disease prevention. But very quickly, both Chinese and international scientists closed ranks to condemn both the very idea of his experiment and its actual design and content. He ended up with a three-year jail term and a derailed career. Investigations have also dogged some of his international advisors and collaborators, though by and large, they have not been punished comparably. We should be clear that this event didn't come out of nowhere, even if the way that events hit the headlines in social media sometimes makes it feel that way. Capacities for genetic engineering have improved dramatically in the last decade. 
In particular, the development of CRISPR-Cas9 technology has made possible a far greater accuracy in efforts to modify DNA. While some research is simply aimed at new scientific knowledge, this is not true of most research in this field. Most, and indeed a growing proportion, seeks a rapid path to clinical applications. This is supported by massive private, for-profit investment. Almost every significant researcher in the field has formed a for-profit company to market the results of their research. Universities are now often part owners of these companies, and it has become common for people to be simultaneously professors and the CEOs of these businesses, which seek to market technology initially developed within the university. Whether or not universities are adequately compensated for their investments, which are often public investments in the underlying science is a separate question. The companies have been darlings of venture capitalists who saw and still see huge opportunity in genetic engineering to the point of developing specialized scientifically educated investors who try to stay connected to elite university centers. In this field, one of the most famous is Boris Nikolic, who was named as one of the executors of Jeffrey Epstein's will after that investor died in shame. Governments are also actively involved, not least in China, which has a less developed private investment system. The Chinese government embraced plans to make sure China would be a global leader in this new field, as with artificial intelligence. Both national pride and global economic standing were at stake in the competition. Moreover, there is competition also among Chinese regions, universities, and research centers, as there is in the US and the UK. Not least, for-profit and government financing entwined with a range of lucrative medical specialties. Most importantly, assisted fertility and related dimensions of reproductive health have become an enormous industry. Players include individual physicians and groups with larger or smaller practices, various forms of prepaid health organizations or third-party players, international medical tourism, to providers where services are not offered by national healthcare systems, and not least pharmaceutical companies. Indeed, gene editing straddles the boundary between drugs and other, other forms of therapy. So it's closely involving of pharmaceutical companies. Many labs, especially in the US, were working on related gene technologies before and at the same time as He Jiankyi and continually. It should be clear that this line of scientific work is called genetic engineering for a reason. It is about taking action, not just observing, building engines, not cameras, in the phrase Donald McKenzie used to describe financial engineering. Among other things, this means that the research and experimentation was not only undertaken with action in mind, with close relationship to investment and potential markets. A separate story would explore the internal competition, hierarchy, capitalization, and differences of style among labs and companies in the field, even in the US, West Coast versus East Coast. For example, it became part of the brand of the UC Berkeley team under Jennifer Dudna, the recent Nobel laureate, to express concern for social and ethical issues. But genetic engineering is a fast moving field. There were big high profile and high capital projects for the elites. One famously is George Church's cloning of woolly mammoths, as well as his fundamental work on genome sequencing. But especially for those with less secure funding and less glamorous reputations or positions, there was also pressure to demonstrate dynamism, risk taking and high potential. This was, after all, the era and the high technology business sector shaped by Mark Zuckerberg's famous slogan, move fast and break things. All of this had a direct impact on He Jiankui, 
After his studies in the US, he returned to China with both an academic appointment and several million dollars in funding from the Peacock Plan, a major regional government program. He later described his decision to set up shop in Shenzhen. Quote, Shenzhen's generosity in encouraging startups, especially venture capitalists, which is comparable to Silicon Valley, is the main reason that attracted me, he said. I am not a professor in the traditional sense. I prefer to be a research type entrepreneur. He established a company, Direct Genomics, with an international advisory board and a publicist, ready for the big launch. He licensed technology developed in the US and he undertook clinical work on fertility. Specifically, He entered the business of reproductive medicine with work on diagnostic tools for cancer and genetic abnormalities in embryos. It should be obvious that while not as momentous as his eventual gene editing, in utero diagnosis of abnormalities is linked to various human rights controversies, especially abortion. While in the wake of scandal over his experiment, Many scientists, lawyers, and ethicists would speak as though there was a sharp line dividing acceptable from unacceptable experiments. This was not so. Much was governed by vague norms, not clear rules. Let me now call attention to a few significant points from this story. First, the genetic gene editing work was international from the outset, but also embedded in national projects and frameworks. Existing regulation was wildly inadequate. This is true in particular of state regulation, but self-regulation in professional communities was equally inadequate. Indeed, all regulation was undermined by the organization of research and development as an economic competition with very high stakes. So what are the ethical and sometimes legal and regulatory boundaries huh, and others pushed. Much discussion is focused on a prior and more general question. Should there be any technological interference with human reproduction at all? There have been challenges to birth control, in vitro fertilization, and of course, abortion. Each has been described as a violation of human rights and each has been defended. The underlying questions begin, or at least include, what is a human being and when does human life begin? Religious arguments center on human lives being created by God, in the image of God, in a relationship with God and with souls. Just to be clear, I'm suggesting there are strong religious traditions and resources for giving an account of what it is to be a human. Many find these unpersuasive, but they are nonetheless highly developed. We may borrow from these, but we don't do so in a very systematic way. Did the enlightenment put reason in place of the soul? Well, perhaps, but we should be thinking about how we are going to develop an understanding of the human now. Other arguments outside the religious depend more on tacit, incompletely articulated ideas about who is human, though when ethicists and lawyers are pushed, these do matter. Most of the time, their arguments center more on questions of risk and of who should decide, to which I'll return. More immediate to the gene editing controversies is the distinction between a therapy that modifies the genetics of an individual and germline gene editing that produces heritable changes in lineages and perhaps all of humanity. Many labs around the world were also flirting with ethical boundaries. The idea of applying gene editing techniques to humans aroused anxieties in the public and among some policymakers. But perhaps even more, it aroused eagerness among the um, research type entrepreneurs that Hood described. Shortly before Hood began his project, in fact, a committee of the US National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine issued a report suggesting that it might be time to permit trials of human germline editing. In trying to 
connect this case to conventional approaches to human rights, a question we face is who has standing as a claimant? Human and rights, human rights has been very heavily structured by the idea of claims against violations. This isn't the whole of the field. There is also an account of what the good should be in human rights terms. But claimants are important, particularly for legal action in regard to human rights. Now, perhaps Lulu and Nana could claim if they come to be dissatisfied with their gen genetically altered state, it'll be rather late in the story. But mostly, humanity as a whole would seem to be the only possible claimant, which obliges us to ask whether taking the risks of human germline editing is a crime against humanity. That's a very high standard to meet. It's relevant that projects of genetic engineering and controversies over them are much older. There is a developed way of thinking about these. The genetic gen eugenics movement of late 19th and early 20th centuries was widespread and widely respected until Nazi breeding efforts discredited the project in many eyes. There had been plenty of travesties and outrages produced in de democratic societies as well, however, and indeed Nazi Germany based some of its eugenics programs on those developed in the US. Targets in the US and elsewhere were those deemed mentally defective and sometimes physically inadequate, criminally inclined or degenerate, all poorly defined terms. In practice, the actions were taken very disproportionately against black Americans and other racial and ethnic minorities and against the poor. Such abuses did not at all end after the scandal of Nazism. Forced sterilization continued for some years in the West, though with increasing regulation and efforts to render it appropriate to individual cases. It continues still in several authoritarian societies. Most people listening will remember, I suspect, the babies in bottles in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, I'm not sure how many of you will remember that Foreign Affairs, the Journal of the Council of Foreign Relations, was originally named the Journal of Race Development. Eugenics is just one example, and I'm not going to go on into others, although they overlap in interesting ways, the development of public health. And of course, gene editing is just one of a host of contemporary technologies offering therapies, augmentations, or transformed reproduction to human beings. There's cloning, neural implants, musculoskeletal prostheses, pharmaceutical interventions, drugs, but drugs with long-term, not just immediate significance, gender reassignments, surgical or otherwise, biomic adjustment, these build on longer paths to improved health and lives. In some visions, say of transhumanists, we can eliminate mortality by transferring human identities and capacities from decay prone carbon platforms to more durable silicon, i.e. by having our, the contents of our brains uploaded into computers. How many of you have made provision to be frozen when you are near death. Very few have argued that this is a right, but if it is indeed possible, should it be considered a human right? And doesn't that point to a problem? One problem that Michael Sandel raises is whether perennial pursuit of individual improvement leads us to be the kind of people we want to be or organize our societies in ways to which we want to belong. Now, there are several big challenges posed by gene editing or related new technologies for human rights, for policy, and simply for people. A very basic first question is who decides and on what basis do we assign them that right? In Western democracies, we expect individuals to make many of life's basic decisions for themselves. This is indeed spread beyond Western democracies to procedures of informed consent in many other settings, including in China for He Jiangke. So far, this is um, in fact not 
typical of the kinds of genetic engineering that He carried out. After all, it was on unborn fetuses. It was their parents who gave consent. There are biohackers who use genetic techniques to attempt to modify themselves. This is an interesting story, but I'm going to skip it, that there are literally thousands of people um, who perform genetic experiments on themselves and see themselves as pioneers of a decentralized informal sector, perhaps anarchist um, wave of use of the genetic technologies. But therapeutic non-heritable gene editing is what can be a largely individual decision. The UN High Commission for Human Rights Declaration on Genomics emphasizes individual rights of consent and control of data, but says nothing about rights in decisions to transform others, perhaps partly because it predates gene editing. But at least in the near future, it is unlikely that germline gene editing will be something individuals can choose for themselves. Even if they do, it will implicitly be chosen for their offspring. Remember that the very definition of it is that it becomes and creates inheritable characteristics. So is the answer to who can decide parents? Do parents own their offspring as property? In fact, it is property law which underpins parents' decisions in many cases, though in most areas we are uncomfortable seeing children as property. Or do parents stand to their children in the relationship of the biblical God to humanity? Can they command that people shall have blue eyes and blonde hair, be both smart and studious, conform their desires to their parents? Does the parental role as guardians for the immature empower them? Does parental responsibility for therapeutic decisions about their children's health, like whether to have a vaccination, extend to genetic alteration. It's not obvious. If not individuals themselves or parents, is the answer doctors? This might make sense for therapies, but I see no reason why it's the right answer for transformation of human beings. Nonetheless, the basic demand from those producing and deploying the technologies is let us regulate ourselves. Not precisely let every doctor decide for herself or himself, but let the community determine the norms which physicians will follow and, if possible, be its own enforcer. This is often presented as a call for the self-regulation of science within a vaguely Mertonian or Polanyian notion of the Republic of Science. But the creators and deployers of gene editing are not scientists of such accounts concerned mainly with truth, motivated by curiosity and prestige, not money, corrected by organized skepticism. Like He Jiang He, they have companies and professionally lucrative practices. The demand to self-regulate is made at least partially in bad faith. And in any case, the self-regulation achieved is at best very partial, as the He Jiang He case demonstrates. If the, is the answer, in fact, whether we like it or not, reducible to the duality of either the market or the state? Will the future of Chinese humanity be decided by the state and the future of American or British humanity by who has the wealth to command medical procedures? States govern part, but not all of investment. They may choose which individuals can benefit and how, but they are not able to currently govern the whole process. When we say the market, we mean not just a dispersed pool of relatively small consumers exercising individual choice, but a congeries of professionals and small businesses buying technologies and offering services and products. One of the illusions of thinking the market is that we, manage, we, have, we imagine something like producers on the one hand and consumers on the other. There are lots of intermediaries. It's worth noting that this is not simply a national question, as I said earlier, because fertility treatment has become an object of medical tourism and genetic manipulations are following in its wake. This raises the question of what state-like power 
can obtain across state borders if there is to be a human rights regime. How will we regulate and can we prevent abuses? Well, there's an immediate problem because very few state regulators have sophisticated knowledge of the new technologies or are funded adequately to keep up with the rapid developments in the field in the way that say specialized venture capitalists do. It is also hard to establish national regulation of an international techno science and its new set of practical policies, possibilities. Regulation of biohacking is challenging. Its gene editing technologies are not so forbiddingly expensive that they are exclusive to big and government regulated labs. They are dispersed in the informal sector, hard to trace. Public awareness and citizen empowerment should be basic to regulation. But in this area, they're severely lacking. Knowledge is limited largely to science fiction, television, and film. So can we effectively adapt human rights? This may mean recognizing additional rights, say the rights of genetically altered beings or following Donna Haraway of cyborgs. It might also mean changing how we reason about rights. There is a tension between thinking of a small number of hard and nearly absolute rights and thinking of a large number of rights, large enough that these are inevitably in tension with each other and require not merely being identified or protected, but mediated. In general, the human rights tradition has made absolutists of us. We treat rights as demanding complete adherence and as trump cards against other considerations, which we regard as merely interests or merely prudential. As the list of rights has expanded, it becomes harder to maintain this absolutism and efforts to deal with mediation become more and more important. Along with these directly practical questions, it is important to return to the underlying issue of identifying the human. That is, we might add rights for genetically modified humans, but we would have to face the question, if you will, the Frankenstein question, are they human? I will return to this in the next lecture, focusing on non-humans who are held in some senses to be persons, corporations, for example, or artificial intelligences. But for now, genetic engineering confronts us with a need to balance some very basic and deep questions. For example, do human beings have a right to maintain the collective reality of humanity? Is this intention with a right to improve oneself or as the US Declaration of Independence has it, to pursue happiness? I'm not sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig, for these thoughts and this lecture. Um, we now welcome questions from the audience. Do uh, do put them in the in the chat, um, and I'm I'm happy to to put them to Craig, uh, and we can have a conversation. I have a question from Alex Burdett at the Royal College of Art. He asks, what drives the adoption of new or emerging technologies and ethics, and how can we accelerate or avoid these futures? Um, good question, Alex. The, a short and perhaps too glib answer is, um, on the one hand, money, and on the other hand, the desire to improve lives. A great deal of the production of the possibilities of these new technologies really has to do with in market investment and the pursuit of profit. But the uptake for the new technologies has to do with our ambitions for ourselves or our children, um, and sometimes the utopias that we hope we can create for society more generally. Um, as to acceleration, we are seeing just an astonishingly rapid acceleration. The question may be more, how can we slow it down? And scandals like the He Jiankui case offer one answer. When there are scandals, things slow down, sometimes. 
building regulatory systems could slow and perhaps guide the whole process. But right now, it's pretty much pell-mell, pretty much unregulated, and there is no substantial movement of public awareness to demand the regulation. Esteban Schmulevich from at Leiden University in the Netherlands asks about the potential of social rights and litigation based on social rights to address some of the inequalities and, and health and, and sort of physical inequalities that you also um, alluded to. These are now enshrined in some constitutions. Sure. And, and so are, are social rights part of the solution to the issues that you're sketching? So social rights can be a good thing, whether they are fully solutions to the challenges posed by gene editing is another question. There are social rights that are, um, if you will, altogether social and social rights that are on the boundaries um, with physical material conditions in various ways. Um, rights of people who are, are ill, rights of the disabled, rights of, of um, um, indeed, as has been proposed in some cases, the particularly talented. Um, there are demands to have special schooling appropriate to the talents of kids. Um, my own view on this is that most of the social rights that are proposed in these debates seem to me um, important considerations in imagining a good society, but very challenging to turn into rights claims for individuals, right? So is a right to paid employment, first off, what we want as opposed to paid leisure, but secondly, um, is it something that translates into a potential claim on a particular job, or is it a claim as to what kind of society we want? And my general view is that the social rights are harder to conceptualize as human rights than as civil rights. They are integrated into constitutions because these constitutions create the structures for the societies to which they apply. And I think a great deal of our aspirations that we try to address with human rights um, whether we call them human rights or not, get implemented in the formation of constitutions um, and social organization for individual countries. So what we pursue as citizens becomes basic to what we achieve as rights, but this leaves open the question of how well those rights are shared with non-citizens of any particular polity or humanity as a whole key dilemma for human rights. I, I want to ask a question myself, actually. And uh, you, you point at the long history of modification and improvement of the human through diet, various kinds of medical technologies. Um, I wonder if you could sketch where you see the turning points in terms of, of what is new in this genetical and sort of the, the current phase of pre-birth interventions and, and what it is we can learn from the way these past interventions have intersected with inequalities in terms of addressing the, the, conse the social consequences of these possibilities. On the first part of your question, I think the thing that is really decisive is the potential to make a highly focused, specific intervention relatively rapidly and have it become inheritable um, and have it therefore rapidly spread. It's the concern that many people had with genetically modified foods. Um, it's not possible to just say, I don't want to eat those foods labeled genetically modified because the um, genes spread into other fields and other organisms and change the overall food supply. 
Um, and the basic issue with gene editing that has changed here is what I referred to, the field refers to as germline gene editing. Um, editing of genes that will not just affect the organism in which they are edited, um, say by trying to create immunity to Tay-Sachs or something like that, but will affect all offspring, which eventually means thousands, millions of people and possibly everybody. Um, and so we have highly discrete decisions that can have that huge um, enduring effect um, and hard to reverse effect. The, uh, you know, they could be beneficial. Many of them are designed to be beneficial and will be beneficial, but A, there are risks and B, it's not clear that they're all beneficial. And here, even some that seem at the level of the individual to be beneficial because they enhance the individual's abilities or capabilities in some sense, whether it's just to be immune from a disease or it's to be smarter or a more talented um, sports star or something, um, create potentials for inequalities that are enormous. So my very quick allusion to meritocracy suggests that part of what we've done is transform an older system of inherited inequality into a new system that still reproduces inequality. Think of it as the Pierre Bourdieu point, but which somewhat disguises and obscures the inequality and creates a high level of motivation to succeed. You have an equal opportunity, go to university, get out there, get a good job, provide better for your children. That provides a tendency to blame the victim then if not everybody succeeds. And that's the world into which we would introduce gene editing, a world that is in a sense thirsty for inequality. And so genetic modifications for children will be like sending your children to tutors, like sending your children to exam coaches, like sending your children to ballet lessons so they look more attractive to elite institutions in the future. Um, and that's a you know, compelling uh, reason by itself to hesitate. Now, can it be dealt with in one way or another? Perhaps. But notice that it's a tension between something that might be good for an individual and bad for a collectivity. And so it focuses our attention on how we shape the collectivity. And so a much briefer answer, very inadequate to your second question is, we invented democracy to try to deal with many of these challenges. Um, we amplified it with a notion of social democracy or socialism. We have various ways of approaching this, but fundamentally we sought over the last couple hundred years, 250 plus years um, or more, ways to have a choice in how our societies are designed in the institutions we will live with. It hasn't been perfect. It's done some good work. It's in trouble right now. Um, but that's been the main way in which we have tried to take hold of these challenges. Is there a link between the emphasis on human rights and this desire to improve and change the human itself? There are multiple links, I think, um, of, of different kinds. So the articulation of human rights in its longer versions with social and economic rights and, and a more elaborate list. Um, but even in very short versions, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and so forth, suggests potentials to which people um, respond. They may aspire to do more and better. They may um, feel that they are, you know, entitled to different experiences of it. So some of the questing, aspiring, seeking character of society is linked to human rights, not all in bad ways, actually, but nonetheless, human rights is also expressing that. A more basic issue, it seems to me, is that 
human rights has tried to be um, in most incarnations liberal. That is, it has been an articulation of political rights with the implication that other aspects of society could be left intact. The limits of that are what have driven the proliferation of social and economic rights arguments, though with far less success um, than core arguments um, about, say, um, the right of free speech um, or the right of, of religious belief. The connection here to the gene editing um, issue is in a sense oppositional or negative. Gene editing demonstrates very graphically the limits of that kind of approach and the importance of attending one way or the other to the material shaping of the future of society and of individual lives. Um, and that's uh, there are advocates for that within the human rights traditions, but it's a contentious domain, as you know. I have a question from Mavish, who is an advocate and teacher from Pakistan, who asks, who should be responsible if things go wrong during such engineering? Great question, Mavish. Um, the, and, and complicated answer, but I'll try to be brief. Um, we're all responsible if we fail to create appropriate safeguards, um, regulations, um, and in some cases, preventions. So there's a very diffuse responsibility that is hard to operationalize except through states and state regulation. There are actions of individuals who have choices. So He Jiang was found responsible and sent to jail. I tried to suggest that this had elements of scapegoating to it, that he perhaps stepped over a line, but it's a line that the whole field of gene editing was flirting with. And therefore, in some sense, the field is responsible. And I regard that as significant because the main approach to regulation is to say that these fields should regulate themselves, that the scientists and physicians in the field of assisted fertility, for example, are best qualified to determine how that field is regulated. I suggested that the financial incentives distort this radically, along with some other issues, um, and that we have a problem because the field doesn't regulate um, very much or very well, and therefore it doesn't ascribe responsibility and it doesn't take responsibility. I think you might say that a characterization of this field is paradoxically a demand that it be seen as responsible for its own self-regulation and a refusal to take responsibility for in fact carrying out that regulation. You discussed meritocracy uh, in the beginning and, and perhaps sort of made us think anew about uh, about meritocracy and maybe also what might be problematic about it. And I have a question from Rui Marquez Pinto who asks about the relationship between solidarity and meritocracy. Um, again, great question. Thanks. Um, I actually have a chapter in my new book about just this question. So I'm prepared to answer for two and a half hours. The shorter version is that they are inimical, inim they, they are at odds with each other. Um, the uh, idea of meritocracy has at least some connections to equality through the notion of equality of opportunity, for example. It has pretty much no connections to solidarity, the interdependence of human lives, um, it has very weak recognitions, for example, of the extent to which the public at large or particular um, institutions and people contribute to the success of individuals. It is organized overwhelmingly as an account of how individuals have abilities and they exert different levels of effort. So by using your abilities uh, well with hard work, you become the CEO of Google. 
by way of getting degrees at Stanford and prior um, high test scores at secondary school and so forth. So it's an ideology that encourages people to think they are responsible for the outcomes of their own um, uh, aspirations in hierarchies. It's um, in addition, encouraging of more inequality without going into length. Um, the idea of meritocracy encourages us to keep make finer tuned decisions. The old aristocratic inequality model did this too. Courtiers in the court of Louis XIV demanded more differences of titles, more recognitions, more ways to be distinct from each other. But the ideology of meritocracy essentially demands layers. You see this acutely in something like university admissions. There has always been some inequality and some unfairness, but meritocracy has actually encouraged us to create more and more levels of distinction so that those at the very top can distinguish themselves more. And it goes on then to other kinds of awards. We've become a society that gives prizes and awards for everything all the time, um, celebrating this meritocracy, um, a bit the way that the makers of Scotch whiskey um, used to have 10-year-old and then 12-year-old, then 15-year-old, then 21-year-old scotches because people were seeking to have more distinction in what they drank. We have produced that kind of um, structure of many rungs of, of distinction. So meritocracy doesn't just disappoint most people who get told they're not the meritocrats. It creates this model of hierarchical incorporation where the only way you can get incorporated into modern society is to participate in a meritocracy and a competition in which you are very unlikely to be a big winner that's one. Two, on the other end, those people who are big winners feel it's not luck, it's not investment from others, it's their own innate abilities that got them the big wins. And three, this is Michael Sandel's point, we are all encouraged to think in aspirational ways about improving ourselves and not in reflexive ways about the character of society. We are made grasping um, for these higher rungs rather than encouraged to think about how we could restructure society in a more egalitarian way or a more solidaristic way. And a more solidaristic way might mean, for example, building local communities. It might mean building institutions that provide collectively for us. Thinking about education differently would be a good example. If we think about education overwhelmingly as providing individual benefits to individual consumers of education, what do we get? We get higher fees for education. We get more and more hierarchical distinction of institutions. Right? Um, and less thinking about it as a public good providing in a solidary fashion for the society of which it's part. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, I have one last question I want to get in. Nicholas Shadid from Arizona State University notes that a modification of human rights to include genetically modified persons could concretize the notion that the human is tied to the molecular biology of the individual. And that is something that exists, but is also relatively recent. The human as biological. What prospects are there for dislodging the notion of the human from its biological substrate? I'm the good transition, because this is partly the theme of the next lecture, um, which I talk about artificial intelligence. Is it, you know, would we think of artificial intelligence as, as human or as persons in some fashion? Um, but quickly, the biological substrate has gained credence. Among scientists, the most common way to think of what it is to be human is to reference the genome. Um, human beings have the genome in common. Um, the United Nations High Commission um, on Human Rights references the genome and says it's what unites all humanity. It actually turns out the genome doesn't so clearly unite all humanity, and we share lots of our genome with non-human organisms, so this is more complicated. But the, the 
more popular notion that we are our biology rooted in the genome is spreading and becoming more and more widespread. And so I agree with you that simply enshrining this into human rights will further that. What are the stakes of furthering that? Well, one question is, does it objectify us in a way? Does it make us objects of action rather than subjects of action? Um, do we become uh, beings to be improved in various ways um, rather than um, beings with an essential worth, some sort of notion of um, an inherent worth, which has been important to the human rights tradition and is what I said was pretty coherently articulated, articulated by religious thinkers and which has been borrowed by non-religious thinkers with much less coherence. Um, so a further consequence of this biologization is reducing the coherence of our account of why we should value humans, right? So great, we're biological creatures. Well, why should we value ourselves more than earthworms? Maybe we shouldn't. Right, and in ecological environmental context, this is certainly on the table. Um, but then why do we value all humans equally? Biology doesn't answer that question very well. Um, and so if we lose the notions of worth to only notions of performance, whether organismic or other, um, we lose our, uh, one of the things that we wanted from human rights which may be hard to achieve in the human rights framework. That is, it may be we have to transform the human rights framework, or what I personally think, we have to get serious about those democratic and social democratic and other projects of creating good societies, not merely rectifying abuses. Thank you very much, Craig. Thank you to everyone who's asked a question. For everyone who joined, we've reached the end of, of our hour. I'm sorry I couldn't use all the great questions this time. Thank you very much, Craig, for this lecture and the conversation. I've really appreciated this form of the lecture series so we can observe a, a thread of thinking unfold over time with breaks and, and opportunities for, for dialogues in between. And so because of this, we really do have an opportunity to continue the conversation. We'll have the third lecture in the near the beginning of the next uh, academic year, hopefully sometime uh, in the autumn term. And I hope everyone will join us again for that occasion. Thank you very much. <laughs>